As of two and a half weeks ago, Aaron and I have been married 33 years. As I've said before, the first 23 were a complete and utter train wreck. It was particularly hard on her. I was a very difficult person to live with. I was loud, obnoxious, rude, selfish, self-centered, arrogant, and potentially dangerous to be around. I did stupid things a lot. See, what happened was we got married based on an assumption that is common in our society. The, the media pushes it, movies talk about it, there are books written about it, that you're supposed to make me happy and I'm supposed to make you happy and the point and goal of marriage is for us to make each other be happy. And that's impossible. You can't make somebody be happy. It's a decision you have to choose to be happy. And it's not really my job to make you happy. And it's not your job to make me happy. So we were miserable for 23 years because we felt the other one wasn't doing their job. Today, we're going to look into the Bible to see God's purpose for marriage. God's design for marriage. Why he instituted marriage. And really, all human relationships. See, it's important, I would say it's crucial when you go into something, anything, to understand the goal, the objective, the purpose. It's pretty hard to do something well if you don't know why you're doing it. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. We're going to be in chapter 2. I'll be beginning in verse 18. God created the garden. He placed Adam into it. He told him to cultivate and keep it. He gave him his marching orders, his instructions. And then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now in our society, referring to somebody as a helper is not a really positive statement. And there are many people, frequently ladies, that are not happy with the idea of being referred to as a helper. So I need to clarify that word a little bit. We need to understand better what God meant by that word. In the Hebrew, that term is really more like helpmate. And what it means is someone who is able to make it where you can do a task that you could not have done without them. One of my favorite analogies for this is surgery. The surgeon, right, he's the guy that gets the big money. He's super skilled. He's gone to all this training and everything. But you have to realize without an anesthesiologist, it's pretty hard to do surgery. The, the moving target makes it really rough. <laughs> See, the anesthesiologist is the helpmate. He makes the surgeon able to do something he could not do without his help. And here's the amazing thing. We should never be offended at being referred to by that title, helpmate. I wish he'd said it about me. He didn't. He said it about the woman. You know who that word is used for the most in the Bible? See, in Hebrew, it's azar is, is the word. And it's used a lot in the Old Testament. But most of the time, it's referring to God. God is referred to by that same title. So ladies, never be insulted at being called that. We call God that. It's important. It's necessary. See, he said here, God says here, it's not good for the man to be alone. Now, you remember, as I've been going through Genesis, I keep saying what it means when God says it is good. See, when God says it is good, that means it fulfills his purpose, that does what he's designed it to do, that it brings glory to God. So when God says it is not good, what it means is it doesn't fulfill God's purpose. It doesn't bring the most glory to God. What is being said here is that for the man to be alone does not bring as much glory to God as for him to not be alone. See, we've got to understand that God's goal and God's desire for the universe is to bring glory to him. And for us to try to do that alone doesn't bring him as much glory. This applies to marriage, but it also applies to everything we do. 
See, God could have designed us as solo creatures. If you look in the animal kingdom, there are a large number of animals that only interact with their own species for procreation. The rest of the time, they're lone wolves. They're solo. They're off on their own. But when the man was alone, it was said that it was not good. See, we are relational creatures. God designed us to be relational, to relate to him and to relate to one another. Not just in marriage, but in work, in friendship, in our families, in our churches. We are designed to work together. There's this old country gospel song that says, Me and Jesus got a good thing going on. You ever heard that song? It's a cute song. It's a neat idea, except if you listen close enough, it really kind of sounds to me like the fella is saying, I don't need anybody else. It's just me and Jesus. Which, we do have a personal relationship with him. We do. And with regard to salvation, that's all we need. That personal relationship with him. But there's more to Christianity than just salvation. I've been talking about this process of sanctification, of becoming more Christ-like. And you really have a hard time doing that by yourself. How are you going to forgive people if you're by yourself? How are you going to love your neighbor if you're by yourself? How are you going to do all the things Christ did, serve, help, if you're by yourself? See, we're designed for this sanctification process to involve other people. We need to not try to be the solo, lone Christian off on his own. I could go out and do all the tasks the church calls us to do. I could go evangelize. I can go do missions. I can go, do, I can go help people. I can go do visitations. But I can never do them as well or bring God as much glory if I do them by myself. That's why every time somebody wants to, me to go on a visitation, I say, well, who's going with me? I can do it fine by myself, but I can do it better. I can bring God more glory when we go do it together. See, we have this individual relationship with Christ, and that's for salvation, and it's wonderful, and we should develop it. But we have this corporate relationship as the church. Have you ever noticed how the church is always referred to as a group kind of thing? 1 Corinthians refers to the church as the body of Christ and all the individual members. Acts refers to the church as a flock. Have you ever seen a flock of one sheep? That's not a flock. Galatians talks about the church as a household or family of God. One person is not a family. Philippians, Paul refers to his fellow soldiers in Christ. God's army. An army of one is not an army. I don't care what the old commercial used to say. This has got to be an army of all of us. See, we're designed to serve. We're called to serve. We're called to bring glory and honor to God. And even though many of us would prefer to do that alone, that's not how he made us. Remember the verse, it is not good for the man to be alone. This is not just about marriage. See, marriage is the beginning of the instituting of human relationships. It's the highest order and highest level of human relationship. But it signifies our need for relationship. So how do we find these helpmates, these people that make us able to do what we cannot do alone? It's interesting that God's going to send Adam to go look on his own. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to all the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused this deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bones of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So I got to wondering, why did God have Adam go look when he knew he's not going to find him? He's not going to find a helper suitable for him among the beasts, but God had him go look anyway. I think that's so that Adam understands it's not up to him to find one. That we're not capable of locating our own helpmate. That we're not, and I need to know this too because I'll start trying to find who I think I need to serve with me. And that never works. 
See, there's a problem. We're looking from a human perspective. There's no way we can do otherwise. God, omniscient God up there, sees all, knows all, knows the hearts of men. He knows who can serve best with us. But me, I still have that playground mentality. I don't know if you remember, but when we were children on the playground, they would have you pick your team, right? And if you got to be captain of the team, you're picking the big, strong, fast kids or maybe your best friend, the one you get along with. And there's some poor little kid who's the last one picked. That's not how we find helpmates. See, I'm not looking for people to help me serve God better. When I go looking for a spouse, I don't need to be looking for somebody who will help me win life better. I'm not even really looking for somebody compatible. Let me give you a list of what we're really looking for, for people to help us serve God better, which is what a spouse is, is somebody that helps us serve God better. But all our relationships are driven by this. 1 Corinthians 1.26, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak to shame the strong, the base things and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. I'm pretty sure there were verses put in there just for me. And that one that says so that no man may boast for God was aimed at me. See, I want to win, right? Life everything even ministry so if i go to find people to help me serve god with the intention of finding the ones that will win then i miss out on god's point the point isn't winning the point isn't having the successful marriage that outdoes everybody else it's not a competition the point is who can help me serve god better See, sometimes we need a friend, a spouse, somebody to serve with that brings out our strength. Not that we lean on them, but that we become better because of them. I am vastly better than who I would be with her. Without her, I'm a mess. See, what we need to be looking for in a spouse, in a friend, in someone to serve with, is people who want to serve God. That's it not who's bigger stronger faster more powerful rich famous but who can make it where we together serve god better i had the opportunity of serving with a fellow at second mile mission now when i first met him he's not who i would have picked for the dodgeball team he moved a little slower than everybody else he he, he forgot things occasionally uh, he couldn't carry but one pallet of groceries at a time, and some of these guys are carrying five. But I would not trade him for anybody in the world to serve God with. I didn't know it when I first met him. He had been a brilliant college professor who was in a little bicycle accident and had a brain injury. And he dedicated the rest of his life to serving God. He was at the food bank three and four times a week. He was there five to seven hours when he showed up. A lot of these people came in, did their hour for a week and went. He was there almost all the time. And here's the key. He didn't just care about getting the food on the shelves and the food in the carts. He cared about the people. And he stopped and took time with them. And he hugged them and he prayed with every one of them. And he remembered most of their names. His heart was in it. He wanted to serve God. See, we don't need to go find a helpmate. We need to be able to recognize a helpmate. Do you notice Adam's response? This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. He recognized her. I don't need to be able to go find my own people to serve with. I need to be capable of recognizing them, of seeing the ones who have a heart for God, who want to serve, who put that at the top of the list. Not the fast, the strong, the quick, the wise, the powerful, the rich, the ones who want to serve. God provides the helpers. We just have to be able to recognize them. See, we need helpers in our lives and everything we do, in our marriage, in our business, in our families, in our churches. Genesis 2.24, for this reason, 
A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That idea of becoming one flesh, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. One of them is they join together to create a new life. But I think there's a really beautiful picture in this that when two become one, their goals, aspirations, desires, and efforts line up. We don't seek competing things. We strive to achieve the same goals. One being, at least a sane one, doesn't have competing results. I've talked to married folks about this before. If you get in an argument with your spouse, what I want you to do is go stand in the mirror and have the same argument with yourself. Because that's about as foolish as arguing with your spouse. What you're doing, if you're one flesh, then your goals, desires, everything you're trying to achieve need to line up. And the only way that's going to happen is if your goals and desires are to serve God. If your goals and desires are to serve yourself, you're never going to line up with each other. When, when we changed, God changed us. We didn't change. When he changed us and we changed from trying to make the other one make us happy to understanding the goal was to serve God, and that that became our goal, then all of a sudden we're lined up the vast majority of the time. We're not perfect, so it messes up. But most of the time, when we go to do something now, our goals are the same. We have the same desire. When it does, there's no argument. You don't argue with people that you're trying to achieve the same thing. You might have a discussion, but there's no argument. See, there's a strong connection here indicated between a man and wife. It says here that the man should leave his father and mother. There's a strong bond between parent and child. But the strongest bond between two people on the face of the earth needs to be marriage. These two concepts that the reason for marriage is to bring glory to God. And that there should be this strong bond between a man and woman. They need to drive our respect for marriage. See, if we look here at the beginning of this verse 24, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. Boy, we really need to know what the this is then, huh? Because it says this reason. Well, what's the reason? Well, if we go back through the text, the only thing we can find before that that could be a reason is that it was not good for the man to be alone. The reason... God created woman and instituted human relationships was that it did not bring the most glory to God. This is true of marriage and this is true of every other relationship we have. Family, friends, work, our church. The goal is to bring glory to God. One of the things we went through that was difficult is something a lot of people go through. It was popularized in the 70s. It's still around today. This discussion of a soulmate. People are told there's one perfect soulmate out there. If you marry your soulmate, you'll be happy the rest of your life. Everything will be perfect. You need to go find your soulmate. There are books written on it. There are movies about it. There are motivational speakers that talk about it. And we both got caught up in that. We must have married the wrong person. And we even kind of agreed we married the wrong person. We should try to find our soulmate. Let me tell you something that's so strange about this concept. It's actually right. There is a soulmate out there for every one of us. And there's only one. But his name is Jesus Christ. He's the one that makes you complete. He's the one that fills the hole in your heart. He's the one that makes you content, fills you with joy. And if you expect another human being on the surface of the planet to do this, you've placed an incredible burden on them, something they can't possibly do. You've elevated them to God status. Let's think about that. God is the only one that can complete you. To expect your spouse or a friend or work or a church member to complete you is putting way too much burden on them. And let's just be honest, you're worshiping an idol. This has bled over into church searching now. We have people that are looking for their church mate. They want the church 
that completes them, makes them whole, fills that hole in their heart that they're happy with all the time, that they have joy based upon their church, that if the walls aren't the right color, they don't play the right music, the pastor preaches the wrong sermon, they're going to leave and go find another church. Because there's a church made out there. Folks, let me explain. Jesus Christ is the only one that does those things for you. And there's nobody that's going to find a perfect church. Find one that is preaching Jesus is God and Savior. Trust in him for salvation. Get out there and grow like Christ. It doesn't matter what color the walls are. doesn't matter what the music is. If you find one you like, great. But let me tell you something. Inevitably, something's going to happen with your church you're not happy with. And if you leave because of that, then your faith was in men and not God. If your happiness depends on how people act and respond in your church, then that's not trust in God. See, here's the thing about happiness. Happiness is a horrible goal. Don't get me wrong, I like happiness. I enjoy it. It's a lot like riding a roller coaster. Up and down. Just I'm happy and now we're not. And we're happy and now we're not. And it's a lot of fun, but by its very nature, it is transitory. It is not a sustainable thing. It's based on your current circumstances. And I have fun with happiness. I got a good present I like. Yay. I saw a movie I like. Yay. It's fun. But don't count on it. Don't depend on it. Be aware it's going to get jerked out from under you. It's a bad goal, but it's an awesome result. See, when we began serving God, lining up with what we wanted with what he wanted, then he allowed a lot more happiness in our lives. We had those moments. We enjoy them. We don't count on them. We don't depend on them. We're actually striving more for joy than happiness. But happiness is fine as long as you're not chasing after it. It's like that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. No matter how close you get, it's going to keep moving. No matter how much happy you got, you want another one. No matter how long it lasts, it's never long enough. I need me some more happiness. But when we serve God, when we do his will, that happiness will come around. Don't be anxious about it. Enjoy it when it happens. Don't expect it to last, but have fun with it while it's there. See, what we need to do is we need to look at our relationships differently the standard way most of us look at a relationship at least me is what can you do for me what do i get out of this now the better of us look at it what can i do for you yeah, that's nice but that's not what it's about either the bottom line is relationships should be what can we do together to serve god and bring him more glory that's why God instituted relationships. That's why he instituted marriage and by extension, every relationship. What can we do together to serve God? God will help us find our helpmates. I don't need to go searching. I just need to pay attention. He will have them come into your lives. Just coming into this town, this has been an effect for us gigantically. I've had people come into my life that have been such a help in serving God that I never would have found it if I'd gone looking. I'm not going to list names, but there's an awful lot of them that just walked right in. And you know, if I'd have been blinking, I might have missed it. But there they were, and I noticed they wanted to serve God. And I thought, wow, God, if that's the one, I'm, I'm good. I'm down with that. And he's lined it right up. It's been amazing. There are no, I have to use this term because I don't have a better one. There are no lone wolf Christians. Have you ever heard that term? Yes, you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ on your own and you're saved and you're going to heaven. But a functioning Christian does more than just go to heaven. A functional, growing, maturing Christian needs other people. We don't do this on our own. See, it's all about relationships and how we view them. The key relationship is that relationship with Jesus Christ. And that relationship begins by placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that his death on the cross is sufficient to pay for our sins. If there is anyone here who has not placed their faith and trust 
in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. In a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer and we're going to sing a song and I would invite you to come forward and place your faith and trust in Christ. Additionally, if anyone is in need of personal prayer, I would love for you to come forward so that I might pray over you. And if anyone is desiring membership in this church, this would be the appropriate time to come forward for membership. Father God, we thank you so much that you provided relationships for us, that you instituted marriage and all other relationships, Father. Help us to have a proper view of relationships. They're not to serve us. They're not even for us to serve other people. They're for us together to serve you. Father God, help us to have the eyes to see those around us you desire to help with. Help us to forge strong relationships in serving you. Help this church to go forward in service to you, to bring you the glory and the honor in all things. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.